Welcome to the Financial Coaches Podcast, where we talk about how to build your practice from startup to scale up, while being the kind of coach your clients crave. Finally, a podcast for financial coaches. Here are your hosts, Maria Casillas and Cody Sizemore. Hello and welcome back to the Financial Coaches Podcast. My name is Cody Sizemore and I am joined here by my lovely co-host Maria Casillas and we also have a very special guest today, which I'm going to keep you guys in suspense for, all right? (laughs) We're going to get to our special guest in just a moment, but first we want to remind you about just a couple things. Um, So first and foremost, we have been doing this for over 100 episodes now. You know, uh, just a few episodes ago, we had a very special guest on our 100th episode, uh, 100th episode rather. And, um, you know, part of that is building our community through this podcast um, so that we can build a community of like-minded coaches that are all trying to do the best work that they can, you know, make the most impact that they can. And of course, us being there for these said coaches and also growing with you as well. And one of the best ways to connect with us is through our free Facebook group, which is New Money Habits Financial Coaches. So make sure that you join that and be a part of that community there. Um, It's a growing community with some awesome people in there. So you definitely do not want to miss out. And also because we don't do anything as far as like paid ads go, or anything like that. Uh, we don't make money off of this show. The only reason that we do it is because we want to give back. So one of the best ways that you can help support us through that is to like the show, to follow the show, to subscribe to the show, to share the show, all <laughs> of that kind of stuff that we know that you're just absolutely dying to do. So we would really appreciate those two things if you would do that. And with that being said, now that we got all the fun stuff taken care of, Now is the time to unveil the special guests. So drum roll, please. Okay. We have Renee Earwood with us, who is here to talk to us about a very, very important topic in today's world, and that is student Mm -hmm. loans. So Renee, welcome to the show. We're glad to have you. Why don't you tell us and then also the listeners a little bit about yourself? how you got started with everything and, you know, what led you to be here today? Yeah, well, thank you so much, first and foremost, to you, Maria and Cody, for having me today. Um, Once again, my name is Renee Earwood, and um, I am a financial coach, uh, like all of you, and my niche is student loans. Um, And to tell you a little bit of kind of about my background story, um, I have been working in the financial services industry, I would say, for about 18 years. Um, I started very young in a customer service position with a retirement services company, and I learned a lot about retirement. I learned a lot about insurance more than I ever thought I probably wanted to know, um, but I still had some struggles. So I I ended up joining a nonprofit a budget coaching program that paired you up with kind of a money buddy mentor that would work with you because um, I definitely had gotten to the point where while I had been through a lot of financial struggles, I kind of got to that point where maybe I make too much money to, you know, feel like I'm broke all the time. Um, and so through the course of that mentorship program, um, I just really fell in love with the process of coaching and mentoring, and I really wanted to give back. So I became a credit counselor with that same nonprofit. Um, and I ended up becoming the director of the same program that really helped kind of change the course of my financial life. So first, I just want to say I'm really grateful for that journey. Um, but one thing that we noticed over and over again in credit counseling, we were doing the budgeting, we were doing the debt repayment, we were doing, um, even helping clients try to avoid bankruptcy and housing and so many different, um, I guess, areas that all of us as financial coaches work with our clients on. But student loans just kept coming up over and over. And I think we realized we just did not have the expertise to tackle this huge issue that I think one in four households have. And so um, the organization that I was under realized the need. Um, and so I became the 14th credit counselor nationwide under the NFCC which is the National Foundation for Credit Counseling to earn a certified student loan uh, counseling certification. Um, I kind of became a go-to student loan lady in my little town. And, um, you know, from that point, 
every time we would go out and do a workshop or offer budgeting or credit 101 or how to buy a house or student loans, I can tell you that student loans were, was a consistent topic that um, people would flock to, whether we were doing it at the local library or through um, different workplace um, uh, workplace. Uh, financial wellness programs that we hosted, student loans were always a packed house. Mm -hmm. um, I would say something else, just from a coach's perspective, um, it also became the area that I felt I could really start to build trust with clients. Mm -hmm. I don't know what other coaches' experiences are, but I know in credit counseling, clients, we kind of had a saying, right? Clients didn't come to us until like kind of the house was burning down, right? Right. So now I'm in this financial mess. I have all these credit card debt. I'm about to hit a wall. I don't know what to do. I'm going to file bankruptcy. Help me. Um, and student loans is something people would just actually come in and talk to us about. So they didn't have the same level of maybe um, guilt or shame or judgment when it came to the student loan debt that they were in. Mm -hmm. um, and they generally wanted to know how to repay them, what kind of forgiveness programs there were. Um, and that stigma just wasn't there. So they would show up over and over for student loan counseling appointments. It became kind of the ma a good majority of the work that we were doing. And then we were able to build that relationship. And then once we built that relationship, then they would let us start working uh, with kind of the bigger picture, which is what we all want. Because at the end of the day, pseudo loan debt um, is obviously a big issue, but we always want to work with our clients on the holistic picture. It's one part of their overall, their overall budget, their overall financial security, their long-term goals. Um, and so it really was a good gateway for us to really build that rapport and, and make these long-term relationships that I think that we all want. What a cool story. I love the part about how, I, and I didn't even know that. That's really cool. There is no stigma attached to that for so many people. And so that is how you were able to, you, you know, kind of step into the rest of their story as well and, and be able to gain that trust from them. Absolutely. So why do you think there's not as much of a stigma around student loans as, say, other consumer debt? Personally, I think it's just the amount of political media attention that it gets. Mm. I think like any other subject in life, the more we talk about something, the more the stigma um, kind of subsides, right? Um, and when we look at other, I think, realms of personal finance, budgeting, we talk about the how-tos. Um, of how do you budget? How do you do a snowball debt repayment? How do you get your credit up? Um, we talk about the how to's, but we never talk about maybe the emotional impact or how everyone's not perfect or we're all different. Um, but I think with student loans, I think it's already recognized as a problem. Hmm. Um, and everybody accepts that it is a problem, whatever the problem is per se might vary from person to person. Um, but I just think there's just so much attention and we talk about it so much and we hear so much about it. And there's also those potential, those forgiveness programs, right? Um, that people really want to know, am I eligible <laughs> for this charge program? <laughs> These are important topics. So I think all of those kind of come together and make it, you know, not, not as hard to talk about. They don't feel the shame. Um, and I would say that for everybody, uh, shame is still attached to any kind of debt, the stress. And I do think with the balances, you know, a lot of people have student loan balances or house payments. Mm -hmm. um, I just think the overwhelming impact um, also will lead you lead them to come in quicker because it, it's it's really it's really impacting people on so many levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now you mentioned the student loan forgiveness programs that were kind of looming over as a possibility. And, uh, and I think that there's those some of them at least are coming to an end or being told that we're not going to have those anymore. I admittedly don't know a whole lot about that. But I'm assuming that you do. Would you mind talking just a little bit about that and kind of the impact it's going to have on not just the clients that our listeners are going to be listening to, uh, but also the ones who are you know, maybe some of our listeners have student loans as well and have been kind of hoping for themselves that this would go away. I'm just kind of curious, what do we have to look forward to? So, yeah, we, I know a lot, so many people were very disappointed um, when the Supreme Court kind of nixed the uh, 10 or $20,000 in forgiveness uh, recently. Um, but there is still a lot of hope there. This, these programs continue to run. So I like that you mentioned there are some limited time options. Um, so two of them that I really like to highlight today 
is the one time they call it the IDR adjustment. IDR stands for income driven repayment. Um, income driven repayment, there are many different types. And a lot of what's going on right now in the Department of Education is they are trying to fix a lot of problems they created by making the student loan law so complicated. Um, and so one of the ways to fix some of the issues is previously there's 10 different student loan repayment options. Wow. Um, some of those are more standard options. I'll meet with a lot of clients and I see what kind of payment program I want. They say, oh, an income based one. It's like, okay, well, you know, there's like several different ones. Um, and so what would happen before is they would move from plan to plan, or maybe they would consolidate, or they would do different things over the course of time with their student loans. Um, they would kind of, they would lose, or they would restart um, the, the time frame. So most income-based repayment programs, they do have built-in forgiveness, uh, depending on their undergrad, graduate, um, type of loans they but again if you move from plan to plan or if you consolidated or you did certain things or you were in deferment or forbearance then you wouldn't get credit for certain times or they would kind of restart which kept people in this continuous cycle of not getting any closer to forgiveness so with this one kind this one time idr adjustment um the government's actually going to go back they're going to look at all the loans um and they're going to fix that and they're going to say if you have been making income-based repayment programs, um, we're even going to give you credit for some periods of deferment or forbearance. Um, if you've been paying for 20 years, then hey, you're done. Um, again, it depends if you're a graduate or graduate or 25 years, um, usually if you have graduate loans mixed in. Um, there are also some stipulations with this. So in addition to 10 different repayment plans, there have been 10 different types of federal loans issued over the years. Again, all of those had different, um, obviously, rules and stipulations and i would say especially people in my generation i don't want to give away my age but, um i I'll would do say, it <laughs> well, like in the 40 ish range 40s 50 ish range well, well uh some many 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 people have been paying you know for 20 plus years and i meet with clients in my age range all the time whether they were kicking the can down the road or they were moving between plans or we could talk about negative amortization in a little while um, but for whatever reason they're still stuck with these student loans and this is supposed to fix it but if they have old loans called federal family education loans also known as fell loans they will have to consolidate those loans into the newer type of direct loans before the end of the year. Um, and if they don't do that, then they could potentially miss out on any of that kind of back credit or kind of what we call plussing up of the credit. The other really cool thing about that is most people graduate with let's say 16 loans, because if you have a subsidized and unsubsidized loan, and you go to college for eight semesters, you're gonna have 16 loans. Um, and a lot of people don't even do that in a traditional way. I, I certainly didn't. I started college when I was 18. I took a break when I became a mother. You know, I kind of, my college education was not traditional path. Many people start and restart. Um, and so a lot of people even have a mix of maybe old fell loans, maybe newer direct loans. Um, and to consolidate them together, you could actually move towards forgiveness quicker because those newer direct loans paired up with those old fell loans will all adjust um, to give you um, kind of a better deal, if that makes sense. Uh, it will all count towards one versus each one having its own timeline. Wow. <laughs> no, first, of, first of all, where were you 10 years ago when I was finishing off mine? That's what I want to know. Uh, and secondly, no wonder people want to come to you talk about complicated. complicated. I mean, and as you're as you're talking, I'm like nodding like, yep, I remember the fell loan. Yep, I remember the mm -hmm. direct loan. I had all of the subsidized mm -hmm. and unsubsidized, like all of that. And um, yeah, that's that's just crazy how complicated it is. And it sounds like it almost sounds like they're trying to uncomplicate it, but this is the government we're talking about. So I only, yes. I only slightly believe that. Um, yes. <laughs> so they're going to keep you in business for a really long time. I, I am sure. <laughs> uh, I'm at, I know that there are some differences between student loans and other types of debt, more probably even than the stigma around them. Sure. What are some of those and, and how do you help address that with some of your clients? I'm sure that our listeners are going to be like, 
oh, I maybe I should do that with mine. Yes. So I would say I'm going to talk about where they're the same and I'm going to talk about where they're different. Okay. Um, well, let me back up. So student loans, there are a lot of complications. There's a lot of nuances. Um, but student loans, for the most part, we approach it at a very basic level of it is you either want to pay the very lowest amount possible um, if you are intending to get forgiveness. Um, forgiveness looks different for different people and there are um, tax consequences for some people versus other people, which there are not. So there's a lot of considerations there. Um, but if that is not an option, um, then on the other side, then we kind of do treat it like any other debt, right? We want the lowest interest rate. We want to pay as much as possible and we want to pay down as quick as we can because of course, interest. Um, so again, it, it depends on the client. It depends where they're at, what they qualify for, and even what their own financial goals are um, and how they want to tackle those. Um, so that's how we do that is different, though, for each client, if that makes sense. Yeah. Are they amortized very much like a mortgage or are they more like a simple interest, kind of like a credit card or is it something totally different? So glad you asked that question. Um, so it is a simple interest. It does accrue daily uh, based off the balance. And I think that we hear so much debate about student loans. Like you took the loans, you should repay them. And of course, I'm the first person to advocate for responsible borrowing all the time. Um, but I, this is just personal. Um, I know everyone can have their own view, but you know, they're, they, you can look at the I don't want to call them predatory loans, but there are a lot of things that people didn't understand about these loans. Um, and that really comes down to negative amortization. So no, it's not like a mortgage. Um, and when I work with clients, that's something that I make sure I bring to the forefront all the time is that one of the very first things we do is we calculate what their monthly interest is because then you had all these income based repayments. So if I had a very large loan balance and uh, again, this is just real simple math, but if my uh, interest is $100 a month and I'm only making a $50 payment based on my income, then I'm making payments every month, but that extra $50 is actually adding to my balance. So I'm paying, paying, paying. Um, as I continue to pay, my balance is going up. So I think from an emotional standpoint, we can see why people feel so desperate mm -hmm. um, when they call their student loan service providers, which are companies contracted by the government, um, which are just customer service individuals, they have high turnover, they have not given the best uh, information, the government has not been very good at educating borrowers, they didn't really realize this was happening, I would say a, this is a very common story. And I had a client not too long ago, uh, again, has been kind of on this merry go round uh, for about 20 years started out with about a $50,000 balance, has paid over $30,000 back to date, and her current balance is in the 80, around $80,000. So we can see it's not that people aren't trying to pay these student loans off. They just, they, they're they just spinning their wheels with this negative amortization and they never got closer to forgiveness. Again, going back to the IDR adjustment, right? Why they're trying to fix this because when they would move or they move to different plans, interest would also capitalize. There's, there's like 10 different interest capitalization trigger events. And um, which again, just added to the problem, just kept on adding to it. And people just got, so many people just got overwhelmed. It just felt like there was no way out. And unfortunately, I heard time and time again, I will just die with student loan debt and people just give up. So I think that's kind of why I really love doing what I do. Because a lot of it, I think with all of us, right, our money is tied to our hopes and our dreams. Um, I think especially when people start college, you know, we all start college with a dream um, of what our life's going to look like. You know, we... A lot of us have ended up in a financial nightmare um, with really no hope on getting out. But there are so many options and, and there really are a lot of ways to get out. Uh, if you can find the right person who can analyze that and uh, help you create a path forward. Now, I, I do want to, I'm sorry, Corey, real, real quick. I do want to ask you, um, I, I don't want to damper the hope that you just provided for people. But I yes. am curious, if somebody does die, yes. does it still go with them? Is, has that changed or is that still the same? That is still the same. So, okay. um, if somebody, there is, there are also, um, there are seven different discharge programs. Discharge 
there is a death discharge. So okay. I have met with people who are really concerned that if I die, does my spouse inherit this debt? What happens? Um, and I've even met with people who have paid off maybe a child's student loans that passed away unexpectedly. Um, and there is even ways to, if they do that, they can go back um, and, get them right and reverse them and apply. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, Cody. I Go ahead. No, you're fine. So just hearing you speak about the interest rates and use the word predatory, which I totally agree. Um, okay. I've, I've thought that for quite a while. Um, but you also said something earlier towards the beginning of this episode to where you said that there's a lot of problems with yes. the student loans system, right? Yes. So I guess my question to you is like, I know that there's a lot of problems, but if you had to narrow it down to just one or two to where you're like, this is the biggest problem that people are dealing with in the realm of student loans. What do you think it is since you're the one who's there day in, day out, in the thick of it, you know, all the time? Um, I mean, I would say the biggest problem, um, which I think financial coaches will relate to. So I think a lot of us as financial coaches in general, you know, we really want our clients to get to to know their numbers, for example. And I would say knowing their loans. Um, I'll, I like to ask questions and I, as many years as I've been doing this, I don't think I've ever actually gotten, gotten the uh, response I was looking for. So if I ask what kind of student loan do you have? Um, they'll just say a federal one. Uh, again, we talked about there's, you know, 10 different types of loans that have been offered over the years and they have different, um, pros and cons benefits to those. Um, what kind of repayment plan on your, are you on? Um, you know, I get a lot of income based repayment is what I'm on. Well, which type? Again, those all have different stipulations. Um, so a lot of people think they're working towards forgiveness and they are not meeting one of the requirements. I, I think the biggest problem is, is that borrowers don't, I, I, same thing for borrowers. They don't understand that student loan debt doesn't work like any other debt. Um, and they have no idea how complicated the system and they, they, they just know nothing about their loans. I think that is the biggest problem. So the lack oh. of vocabulary and knowledge around Absolutely. the entire thing. Yeah. Well, and I and also really think that awareness of these are different and I need to figure this, I need to really figure this out. Yeah. And, and I don't think that that's all to, you know, place, and I'm not saying that you're doing this, but I don't think that it's all to, the blame to place on the borrowers either. I think a big oh, no, part I have that, Yeah, I think a big part of that is just the clarity from the lender, which is Absolutely. in most cases, you know, our federal government. Um yeah. that's not explaining this. You know, they're just saying like, yeah, just sign the dotted line and we'll give you some money and hope for the best. You know? Well, not just the lender, but also also the institutions that are encouraging the loan. So, right. you know, the all of the universities and the colleges and they they I have a daughter who is a sophomore in college now. And so we went through this whole thing and it is crazy how they're just like, Oh, you, it's just, it's okay. Just do it. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I so agree. yeah, I agree. And you know, going down that. So yes, that was part on the borrower. But if we look towards the other side and where this starts um, and kind of why, you know, I might toss around predatory here and there, you know, predatory is really, if you look at the definition, I think I can best it says something about, um, you know, somebody who's making a loan to somebody who they know is not capable of understanding or capable of paying it back. So if we think about it in that term or in those terms, again, when I say these loans don't work like any other loans, this starts before you ever take a student loan. So most consumer debt, as most of us understand it um, and are exposed to in this world is I am going to go to the bank. I'm going to get a loan for whatever it is. Um, and the bank is going to do some things, right? They're going to check my credit because they're going to see if I have experience repaying it. They're going to see, you know, kind of my credit worthiness. They're going to check my income. Do I have the income to repay this? And then they're going to decide based on all these factors that I actually have the ability to repay um, before they give me the loan. And then once they give me the loan, I know everything, right? I know exactly how much I borrowed. I know what my interest rate is going to be. I have an amortization schedule. And I know if I pay X amount of dollars for X amount of months, then this debt is going to be paid off. Um, so it really starts from the beginning. But student loans don't work that way. Um, they are just freely given out with very, very little. Um, there's the entrance. Um, but I don't think people really understand how it applies. You click through the buttons. 
Um, and again, so, and everything varies. So I'm, I start college with a thought that I'm going to get this job at some time in the future. Um, interest rates, again, we maybe end up with 16 loans, maybe more. Um, during this period, they have different interest rates. Um, and then by the end, I have the student loan balance. I really had no idea. I might have an idea, um, but most people don't. They graduate with this debt and then they get this big student loan payment in the mail and then they freak out because they can't pay it because now they're just working an entry level position as they kind of start adulting for the first time in their life. Um, they call them, they say, hey, guess what? We can lower the payment. You just say, great, that's the only education you get, which is none. Um, and then the balances start to grow. And then um, all these options are just thrown at the borrower with zero, zero education around what are the potential consequences. Um, and most people, by the time they realize it, I don't want to say it's too late, but it's, it's a very stressful situation at that point. Mm -hmm. Now, what would you say to... A coach who's listening and maybe they have a client or maybe they're talking to like a potential client who has a ton of student loans what would you say to them to help their client move through these as efficiently as possible now i know that you've said several times that like every borrower's situation is different so you i'm sure there's no like blanket statement that you can say but just if you, you know, if you had to give the listeners like one tip that's, you know, they're dealing with a client who has a big balance um, on how to navigate through that, I think that that would be pretty valuable. Yes. I mean, my, my advice is to refer them out um, to somebody who, who is specialized in this niche, even if, we're, if it's for that one. Um, I think we all as coaches have our own niche or our specialty. And so we really need to know, um, can I, give the best service to the client in this area. Um, you know, if a, a client, you know, within my coaching, you know, if they want some estate planning or wills, or if they want something that's maybe a specialized area, you know, financial advice, we don't, as coaches, we all don't work with everything. Um, so I think collaborations are really important. Um, I think that um, when it comes to dealing with student loan debt, if outsourcing, you know, that piece of the puzzle, um, or, you know, getting more education themselves, there is the, um, there are, there are programs out there like the CSLP um, program that is affiliated with the university, and you can take it as a standalone course, there, there are programs out there, if a coach really wants to try to start to dive into this, you know, arena, um, but if a coach does not feel comfortable, um, I do highly recommend that they they collaborate or work with somebody who can provide this expertise because, again, um, the wrong advice can cause a client tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And honestly, it can provide some liability to the coach if they give the, the kind of the wrong guidance. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. You know, um, I personally am not super great at taxes. Exactly. So, <laughs> you know, I, uh, <laughs> I've moved that over, you know, I'm just like, you got a tax issue. Cool. Go talk to Bobby, you know, yeah. and I'm not making that name up. Like I actually yeah. have a guy named okay. Bobby that I sent tax for. Um, but it's the same kind of principle, right? Like, you know, know your strength. And if student loans are your strength and you're probably listening to this podcast, you're like, yeah, Renee's on fire. She's spitting facts left and right. <laughs> but if you, if it's not your strength, then maybe, you know, finding someone who, you know, does have this as, as their niche, such as you, Renee, uh, would be a good idea to be in your network. And I'm sure that the favor goes back and forth. I'm sure yes. that's what you just said, like there's areas that you're not the expert on that maybe Absolutely. you can refer back to, you know, so. Absolutely. And uh, I just want to say I laughed when you said that because uh, when I went to financial class in school, taxes was my very least favorite class. And I did it because I had to, but I hate taxes. So I like the way you <laughs> phrased that. It was my very least favorite. It's a very <laughs> least favorite. So yeah, that made me laugh a little bit. But yeah, absolutely. I, I had somebody reach out um, just the other day and they wanted kind of some advice on the pre-planning side and scholarships and um, you know, I just had to say, I want everybody, there's so many clients out there, um, 
there's an abundance of work for us all. And I always want to, I never want to pretend to give advice or be that best person. So I, I commonly do refer out um, when I think there is a coach that's a better fit. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that somebody recently came to you about like scholarship and, and pr- planning on the front side of that. And I'm really glad that you brought it up because that's actually one of the things I was going to ask you next was uh, say that one of our listeners has a client that's sitting in front of them that they themselves do not have this student loan burden. However, they have older kids and they're trying to decide like, how do I help those older kids? like basically negate this whole thing. Like how do I make them not even have to worry about this? What are some creative ways that you can offer them for, I guess, lack of a better word for parenting their kids through this situation so that they don't come out the other side completely, uh, you know, in debt and just hopeless. So I think we go back to basic financial literacy, which again, so many of us, I I certainly didn't uh, have, really any basic financial literacy knowledge when I turned 18. Um, So I think really starting there, because I think there are still some key components that apply to all of them, right? Um, And that's just reading documents, reading statements. Are those things fun? No. Um, But are they going to cause you a lot less grief in the future? Yes. I'm running maybe some mock scenarios. So if I borrow um, $40,000 for school, um, and then I graduate and, you know, maybe this is the kind of job that I think I'm going to get. What is the starting salary for that? What are my living expenses? So kind of doing maybe some mock budgeting and repayment scenarios before they go in. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I just like really always like to think about the n- negative amortization situation. Um and, and there are some new plans coming up, uh, a new new save plan that will help, again, fix one of these problems of negative amortization. Um, but really just getting, paying attention. Like I always say, know your numbers, know your numbers, know your loans, know your loans. Um, think about what that's going to look like before you take them, before you go to college. And I think that also when you can see that kind of in black and white, I don't know if it's like that with your clients, but you know, seeing that visually written down, what does that look like? Thinking through all the implications um, beforehand is very powerful. Um, a lot of another common thing I hear is, oh, they just offered me all the loans. So I took them and maybe I didn't need to take all of them. Maybe I was working a part time job or I got some scholarships, too, and I, I could pay for some of these things. But I just went and, you know, went on a spring break trip or did some of the things that I wanted to because the money was there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think having information ahead of time also helps. Uh, You kind of want to budget for what your student loans are going to be ahead of time. And I think if you have that plan in place before you go to college, you're going to be more mindful of those moments where maybe there's some temptation to take more than you need. Mm -hmm. Yep. I I tell people that I paid for part of my wedding with student loans. Very common. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't know. I mean, I knew, I think actually knew a lot more than a lot of people did. Um, But even still, I'm like, Oh, they gave this to me. And it was way more than I needed to live. And um, so I ended up paying them back very quickly. But still, it was just like all all of the things. And I I learned a lot just through being dumb, (laughs) making dumb choices. Uh, and that's part of the reason I want to make sure that I help my kids not have to learn some of those things that way as well. But they don't necessarily have all of the money to pay for everything. And I also don't want to have to be the one to pay for all of their schooling as either. So like there's actually um, one of my daughter's semesters, she couldn't pay for everything. So we loaned her the money, but I taught her about, I actually charged her interest. She's like, you're going to charge me interest. I said, yes, yes, I am. <laughs> but um, it's mostly so she could learn what that looks like and that she understands how that works um, and not not have it be you know the government who later on is going to do the negative amortization and all of that to her like I just wanted to understand the first five dollars you pay every month goes to this it does not go towards the principal so she can understand that but in a very safe environment rather than one that is super predatory um, so you've actually mentioned negative amortization a few times could you could you teach that to say a sixth grader, like at a sixth grade level, tell us what that is so that when our clients are looking at us with like, we have four eyes, like could that we can actually do that for them too. Yeah. So, um, amortization as most of us are familiar with is a schedule on 
on a repayment and how much of each payment goes to principal and how much goes to interest. And a lot of times we'll see it from our creditors as really nice charts. Um, so with student loans that are in the negative amortization, or I'd say, let's go back. So if we're looking at car payments or house payments, what we normally see is you make a payment every month. And in the beginning, um, more of your payments going towards interest and less to your principal. Mm -hmm. And then over time, you kind of see that start to change. And then by the time you get towards the end of your payments, most of your payment is going towards principal and very little to interest um, until you get down to a zero balance, right? Which is mm -hmm. the goal. Um, so with negative amortization, it's kind of working in reverse. So you are, uh, again, if my monthly interest on a loan is $100 um, and I'm only paying $50 because that's what my income based repayment says I have to pay, then every month I'm paying, but instead of my balance going down a little bit or a lot, depending on where you're at in that schedule, it's going up. So the balance is increasing every single month, even though you're making payments. Um, and then um, again, with student loans, if, if the, the higher the balance goes, um, the more that is calculating off the, the increased off the, principal, uh, the more interest that's accruing mm -hmm. because student loans are this other thing called capitalization. That yeah. So, <laughs> so it's not necessarily working in reverse in the sense that when you say reverse, it's like, I could see some people going, oh, so in the beginning, I'm paying more principal than I am interest. But what's happening is the way that they've structured the repayment, the payment isn't even enough to cover the interest. And so then that interest gets tacked on to the principal, ultimately. Right. And so so that's where you're seeing that the, the negative or that the switch of the reversal. Um, yeah, I, you know, when you mentioned that, that that's what they're doing, because I'm mildly familiar with just the idea of... Um, the income repayment loans or the payback, excuse me. But I did not know that that's how they do it. Like I, I knew they based it on income, but I had no idea that they just like, oh, well, you just don't even have to pay the amount of interest that it even either co covers. I'm like, holy crap, when you said that, like, well, no wonder people can't get out of this mess because it's not like they're paying interest plus a dollar, right? right. Or, or just plain interest. I mean, it almost sounds worse than the interest only loans from the mortgages that were put out there, right? Yes. Um, so that I think that's, that's definitely new information for me and maybe for others who are listening today too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, something else too, I was just thinking about on your point, I have five kids. Yeah. Um, and so obviously, the way I went to school and racked up student loans is different, like you said, for your own kids. And um, I would just tell you just advice that I give them is that we're all kind of rethinking on what that looks like. There are certainly professions that do require degrees, um, but professions that don't require degrees. Um, also, I think a lot of people don't understand um, like ROI, return on investment. So how much am I going to pay? Mm -hmm. um, to get this degree, how is it going to financially benefit me in the future? So I've talked a lot about that with my kids. Um, of course, we're always looking for, you know, all the scholarship and funding opportunities, but, you know, tech schools, trade schools, um, there's so many different ways to meet your personal career goals. Um, so I just wanted to mention that just being a mother of five, that this has been a huge topic over the years, um, also to prevent my kids from you know, making some of the same mistakes that I had to learn the hard way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Parenting's fun. <laughs> it's so fun. Awesome. Well, Renee, this was uh, extremely informative. Thank you. <laughs> you know, a little even, overwhelming. <laughs> what yeah, you're doing, Cody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you. I learned a few new terms today, which is <laughs> awesome. You know, so, um, yeah, I think that you brought a lot of value and I know that uh, the listeners are thinking that as well. So we appreciate you, you know, stepping up to the plate in those manners and, and just being willing to be here to talk about this topic, because it is something that, um, as you said, at the top of the, of the meeting, like it was, it's getting a lot of attention right now. Yes. And, um, you know, there's so many people have to deal with this nowadays and, um, it's very important to be educated on this so that we can help people as best as we can. So, I just want to say thank you for that. Um, there, there is one thing that I was actually curious about. Um, well, really, two things. One is where can people 
find you? Where can people connect with you if they do want to, you know, work with you in some way or learn from you or whatever? Um, so we'll just start there. Where can people find you? So yes, um, studentloancoach.com is my website. Um, you can also find me on social media. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, um, and LinkedIn. I really love working with people over LinkedIn. Um, so you can just type in student loan coach, um, across all platforms. Great handle. And, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well played. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then my follow up question. So student loan coach is good to know. Um, follow up question is, is there anything that you're, working on that you're excited about or anything that you want to like promote or anything like that so yes with the in conjunction with the new money habits podcast um we are working on offering some um just some free educational webinars uh on this you know it's kind of countdown to repayment is on right so uh, as we haven't had to make any payments for about three years. And in this three years, there are many bars who have never had to make a payment and just trying to think about how to get that plan together. Um, so I would just say um, kind of stay tuned for that once we get that up and running very shortly. Um, I think maybe you all can send it out in kind of an email list or um, also if you get on the student loan coach um email list, then we can certainly also make sure that you're aware of, of any of those kind of upcoming um, webinars that, you know, your clients can sit in, you can sit in, you can sit in together with your clients. Um, I also think this, you know, makes for a great coaching date mm-hmm. <laughs> um, with your clients. And um, yeah, so I'm really excited about that. Awesome. Uh, that's something I'm definitely going to be <laughs> sending a few of my clients to. Um, okay. I can think of a few right now, actually. <laughs> so they'll definitely be there. And I'm so just for clarity, I'm not even technically formally a part of New Money Habits. I'm a separate entity. For okay. some reason, they don't like me enough. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That. Don't worry. I'm just kidding. But it's it's cool. So I didn't actually like really know really until today that you guys were working together on that. And I think that that's really cool um, because I think that that kind of shows where New Money Habits is to where, Mm -hmm. like, we are not in competition with each other. In fact, we can really help each other grow. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the very fact that you're collaborating with them on that is um, very cool. And I think that, you know, if there's a coach out there listening that's like, hey, I think that I could collaborate in some way, you know, feel free to let us know. You can email us or, you know, send us a message or, drop something in the Facebook group, uh, whatever works. Um, I will say that I personally am doing something with new money habits as well. Uh, but I'm going to dangle the carrot. I'm going (laughs) to dangle the carrot. I'm not going to tell you guys what it is quite yet, but I'll tell you it's big. It's massive. And I'm excited for it, but that's very cool. Very, very excited that you're going to be doing that. Um, like I said, I'm going to be sending my clients to it for sure. And, And I'll probably even show up too. I'll have to talk to either yourself or, or Mike and Nina over at my uh, new money habits and see when exactly that is. I think you said sometime in September next month, right? Yeah, we don't have an official date, but we're almost there. So again, just stay tuned. But um, once we get the details down, then we'll be sure to let you know. Okay, exciting stuff. Awesome. This has been really fun, Renee. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. You are most most welcome. That's my daughter's middle name, by the way. So I do love your name. Just thought, I, thought I'd throw that out there for you. <laughs> thank you again for joining us today. And thanks all of you listeners out there, especially those of you who have joined us every week since the very beginning. We really, really appreciate each and every one of you for coming back. And we look forward to seeing you next week. <laughs> Bye, guys. Thank you for listening to the Financial Coaches Podcast, brought to you by New Money Habits and Sizemore Financial Coaching. Submit your questions to our hosts by emailing podcast at newmoneyhabits.com. Be sure to subscribe to be notified of future episodes and join our growing group of like-minded coaches on Facebook. And until next time, happy coaching. Music provided by Summer School.